Hey, Sats fans, welcome back to Swan Signal Live. I'm Brady Swinson, head of education at Swan, and I'm here to host another episode, the 73rd episode of Swan Signal Live, here today with Jan Pritzker and Matt O'Dell. We're going to talk about the harms of invasive KYC AML policies that um, we begrudgingly adhere to in the name of spreading Bitcoin adoption around the world. But we're going to talk about just how terrible they are um, as, as an effect on society, go into uh, talking about Bitcoin uh, and its uh, role as a tool for privacy and freedom in the world. It's going to be a great episode. Really excited about it. Before we dive in, go over to swanbitcoin.com and uh, check out our offerings. We offer you the easiest, fastest way to start stacking sats uh, in the United States. You can be onboarded through that terrible KYC process. Actually, the KYC process is really nice because we've uh, built it out to be really smooth. So in that regard, it's really easy and nice, but uh, it's uh, it's an invasion of your privacy and we should not have to do it. But it happens in about five minutes on Swan and you can start stacking some sats uh, really quickly. It's a great way to onboard your friends and family, You know, grab their phone and, and show them how to get it done and, and they can start stacking sats. Swan is adding all kinds of services uh, uh, through 2022. We're really excited to roll out Lots of new, uh, like a full-fledged suite of uh, Bitcoin-related services for our clients and customers. Over at Swan Private, uh, a lot of the customers are getting uh, kind of sneak previews of what we'll be offering and rolling out to the rest of our client base uh, soon. Uh, we will be dropping an app sometime in 2022, uh, working on that, and it's looking absolutely amazing. Thanks to all of the alpha testers out there on Telegram who have been putting the app through its paces and helping us put together a, a beautiful, slick uh, experience on your mobile device. All right, we'll jump into this episode now with Matt and Jan. Gentlemen, welcome to Swan Signal. Welcome back to Swan Signal Live. Appreciate you both yes. being here. My Always. pleasure. Thanks for having me. And of course, thanks for having me, Brady. But it's like, you know, <laughs> was what a hard else get. are you going to do? Yeah, it was a hard get. <laughs> it was a hard get. Uh, I basically <laughs> just... I was like, Matt's able to do it. So, uh, Jan, you're on for, uh, you know, Wednesday, January 19th. Sounds good. Clear my schedule. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, I, Matt has been uh, kind of making some tweets over the years, uh, last couple of years, definitely last year in particular. Uh, and I'd like to pull it up uh, real quick. Hold on. Let me turn on the screen sharing for this. All right. So this is the tweet that sort of got me thinking about this episode. And speaking with Jan, uh, you know, kind of behind the scenes and, and on, like learning about his uh, just absolute, you know, kind of distaste or hate for uh, AML KYC laws. Uh, and, and he's, you know, kind of understands them better than um, a lot of people, even a lot of Bitcoiners, I think. So knowing this, like, you know, our co-founder CTO is uh, really frustrated with AML KYC laws and seeing Matt say, you know, that, We've got to, as a Bitcoin industry, start being more, uh, you know, vocal about the harms that are being caused and the absolute, you know, you know, ineffectiveness of all of these of these laws. So, so Matt tweets for those listening. Um, uh, I understand that uh, regulated companies um, have to comply with burdensome regulations. All I ask is they fight for user privacy as much as they fought for the right to dump unregistered securities on retail, which is a great <laughs> way to put it, obviously focused on the uh, on crypto exchanges. And then he replied to that with uh, how many users have to be put at risk of theft, extortion, persecution, and identity theft before top industry leaders start pushing back on the dangerous and ineffective data collection policies required by our governments. The silence is deafening. I absolutely agreed and uh, wanted to kind of break that silence, at least on behalf of SWAN today. Um, so Matt, well, let me kick it over to you, uh, since you are you know, a well-informed critic of AML, KYC, and other privacy invasive laws. Uh, would you like to kind of set the stage, give us some context for you know, where these things came from and how they're being used? Um, they're maybe to fight crime as their, intent, their stated purposes, but um, maybe the actual intended purposes might be less uh, publicly declared? I mean, first of all, I would say that, uh, you know, that tweet wasn't necessarily focused at you guys. Uh, it was more focused, like you said, on like the crypto exchanges like Coinbase and uh, Binance and Kraken. Kraken's been pretty good about it, actually. Uh, and Gemini. And like historically, uh, they've been fighting this long lobbying effort in terms of 
dumping shit coins on retail uh, and making sure they're not classified as securities. Uh, but they have not really, pu at least publicly, focused on um, these these regulations that really harm their users and put them at risk. Um, and discriminate against access, like talking about free and open access to the Bitcoin network. I mean, a key aspect of Bitcoin is its permissionless nature. Um, but obviously, these on ramps are are very permissioned and restrict a lot of a lot of users. Also, I'm you definitely had me on this show, like right when Swan was launching, and we had like a very good conversation about the dangers of KYC. I think with Jan and Corey were on it. So um, I do commend you guys uh, for doing more than most. And uh, the Bitcoin only companies in general tend to uh, have, you know, less revenue. Uh, so less ability, you know, less weight behind them to kind of throw against uh, these policies. But KYC AML stands for Know Your Customer Anti-Money Laundering. And it's uh, the idea is it's supposed to stop criminals and it's supposed to stop uh, money laundering. Uh, but really what is happening is uh, criminals are able to get past these laws. Uh, they either use stolen uh, identity information or they actually buy identity information. There is markets that have actually been enabled by Bitcoin uh, that allow uh, criminals to go and buy from, you know, developing world countries, uh, poorer people in these countries, they'll pay them like 40 to $150 uh, in Bitcoin, and they'll just go and do the KYC on Binance for them. So criminals are getting around this regulation. It's not actually stopping criminals. And instead, what is happening is every major Bitcoin company is being forced to keep ever growing lists of Bitcoiners in our transaction history. Um, that data is very difficult to secure. And it is getting leaked, it's getting shared, and it's being used against honest uh, law-abiding users uh, and it's putting them at risk. Jan, uh, your reaction and just your thoughts uh, on AML KYC and like how you came to, um, you know, understand that they were, you know, useless basically and not, and beyond that, like actually harmful. Yeah, so I, my first run-in with thinking about this more deeply was actually in 2017 when Equifax got hacked. And I don't know if you guys remember, I think it was like 40 million people lost their, um, you know, identity information. Things Wasn't like it every years. adult? Or like 140 million. It was like a ton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe like 140 million. It was huge. It was, yeah, it was pretty much everybody in America got wrecked. And that information is out there now floating around, right? And that was the first time when I had my personal wake up call as to as to this. I mean, I obviously knew that there were centralized repositories of identity and fall over the place. And, um, you know, I was always sensitive to that. But that was like a major, major wake up call to a lot of Americans who had first time been, you know, told, hey, like this institution, which is supposed to trust, you're supposed to trust this institution with your, you know, your, your deepest secrets. They're, they're the credit agency. They know everything you've ever done financially, pretty much. Um, and what it is, is it's just a giant honeypot, right? So you collect all that info in one place and it's just a move. It's a great target for hackers to, ta to tackle and they can spend unlimited amounts of resources doing that because the, the, the value of the information is so high that they can spend millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of attack power trying to get at it. So the, you know, the, the best thing you could do is not have that info in the first place. Of course, the entire American system of credit is based on these agencies existing and tracking your every move. So it becomes problematic. So I think, you know, when, when you look at this and you start looking at it deeper, um, as Matt mentioned, these laws are pretty ineffective. Uh, and I know this from two things. One is there's research out there and it's saying things like, you know, KYC AML is stopping like 0.1% of crime, something like that. But beyond that, I know it from personal experience, as Matt mentioned, you know, people use stolen identities, fake identities, um, you know, they do that to attack exchanges and they come to Swan, they come to other places trying to set up fake accounts and we kill them, you know? And so the thing is that KYC AML acts in two ways. One is it's creating this, you know, surveillance arm of the government. They're basically using the banks as their surveillance mechanism. And you could even think about it as like, uh, you know, a search and seizure without probable cause, right? Because they're basically assuming you're a criminal asking you for all this information and, the reality is that most people aren't and the criminals, you know, they, they get around it anyway. 
So um, I really like this phrase that I heard from Andreas one time, Andreas Antetopoulos, uh, who was my uh, orange pill into Bitcoin. He said, you know, if they do these kind of lockdowns, all it does is catch the innocents and the idiots, which is true. Like that's that's who gets caught. If you're a criminal with sophistication, you can get around these things very easily. Um, but the innocent people who are coming down and trying to uh, just, you know, buy Bitcoin for themselves privately and transact for their own purposes. Now all of their repository information, all of their information is stored in the repository and hackers can get at it very easily. So it's a, it's a very major issue. I, I agree. So these, I mean, these laws started being created, like the genesis of them were some banking laws that uh, came to pass in the 1950s, the, along with the FDIC Act, actually. Uh, and then just increasingly became strengthened and more invasive uh, after that. So the Bank Secrecy Act in the 1970s uh, emboldened them. Um, the Financial Action Task Force was created in 1989 uh, by the G7 and basically you know, assumed a lot of these KYC AML laws that had been created uh, by the United States and started enforcing them internationally in the name of fighting terrorism. Um, and then, of course, 9-11 happened and the Patriot Act uh, even stepped up even further the kind of reach of uh, internationally and even domestically of the KYC AML laws. Uh, you know, and now every company is required to uh, verify identity of all customers, who want to open an account, keep those records for five years, uh, even after account closures and run customer names through lists of known suspected terrorists. Uh, and then of course that, you know, that data is used in all kinds of nefarious ways that, um, uh, that we have, you know, very, uh, little insight into, um, I, I, Edward, uh, Snowden, you know, maybe helped us understand a little bit more what, uh, how the government uses our data. Um, so this, seems to be like the establishment of a pretty well developed at this point kind of orwellian uh octopus tentacles going all over the world um gathering data and sucking it up into these uh you know various spy systems and um all of it's done in the name of you know fighting crime or terrorism um what are the like do we have numbers on the actual effectiveness of crime fighting uh using these laws like do they even help uh, i wanted to address something real quick about the bank secrecy act which i think is interesting oh, sure. you know yeah. um they put a ten thousand dollar reporting limit on right in 1970 or whatever that was so in today's money that's actually more like seventy thousand dollars worth of value so basically what they're doing is they said you have to report these fairly large transactions and then over time, because of inflation, as we all know, Bitcoiners understand inflation very well. Uh, the average American understands it more now that they've experienced it happening uh, full on for the last couple of years. So we now understand that the effect of the law that's written in absolute numbers, like $10,000, what that means is that over time, more and more financial transactions are surveilled. So just by inflation alone, we went from surveilling every $10,000 transaction to effectively surveilling every $70,000 transaction because that's the amount of value that they were covering. So we, we kind of expanded 7x in the, in the amount of transactions we're, trans, we're now evaluating because back in 1970, you know, that would have been a much smaller number. So uh, these laws, once implemented, they, have, they take up their own life, right? Like, as we know, all government agencies, they have their own reasons for existing. You create them and then they just grow and they want to expand their reach. But even just as the law is written, the reach is expanded automatically, not to mention the fact that they're not trying to alter the laws and make them much more stringent and much more uh, onerous. And it does create a ton of compliance problems and, and reporting requirements. Uh, and we can get into the numbers a little bit, uh, but I just wanted to point out that I think there's, <clears throat> there's two things to talk about when we talk about KYC and AML. And there's the official reason for these things, which is like to fight terrorism, right? Um, and there's also the unofficial side effect that is useful, which is to fight, uh, let's say, fraud on a, on a low level for a company like ours, um, which is basically, you know, you want to be able to determine if somebody coming to your platform is, is a bad actor that's intending to defraud you. Now, I think there's other ways to do that, but, um, you know, that is one of the problems now that we've created the system. It's very easy to tap into the system of identity and, and data sharing, and that creates an incentive for the system to continue to perpetuate and grow itself, right? Everybody wants that data. Every bank, every financial company wants to use that data for their own purposes to protect themselves. And they're also required by the government to do so. And that's a self-reinforcing 
effect that, that causes the growth of the system. Whether we think it's effective or not, it, it will continue to grow. Very good points. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. Like, do we have, like, Matt, do we have any hope, like, of fixing this through some democratic process? It's just, it seems to be metastasizing no matter which party's in power or whatever. It just, it's like, uh, it's in the interest of the entity of the state at this point. My my optimistic case is uh, that, first of all, we've never really been in this situation before, right? This this These kind of policies have uh grown larger and more burdensome over time at the same time uh our lives have gone increasing digital right and so when we're talking about these kind of situations it's not just a bitcoin thing like literally every aspect of our daily lives um is tracked and surveilled and it, that that surveillance is constantly growing um you know little things like uh like the, the process for trying to like register a house or register a car or something like that there, once you start like looking into uh, like trying to protect your private information, it becomes readily apparent that uh, it is very, very difficult in today's society. And at the same time, our whole lives are moving digital. People are voluntarily sharing things on social media. Uh, we have, you know, always on mics, uh, in the forms of these smart devices, these assistants, stuff like Alexa, Google. Um, we have Google's, you know, checking everyone's email and their calendars and whatnot and monetizing it and sharing it. So this is a, a, a mass phenomenon. And what I expect to happen is we're going to get burned. We're going to get increasingly burned. You know, Jan talked about earlier the uh, the Equifax hack, which literally every American adult is my understanding got compromised by that. And that wasn't even an opt in. Like, it's not like I choose to be an Equifax customer. Like their business model yeah. is they just track us all. Like I don't pay Equifax. Like there's no relationship I have with Equifax. Um, so we're going to continue to get burned. We're going to have foreign governments, malicious individuals use that data against us. And it becomes a national security issue. It becomes a situation where uh, we're putting our citizens at risk. We're putting our country at risk. We had, you know, the U.S. government had their employee database hacked by, they believe, the Chinese. They couldn't even keep that secure. So I think the optimistic take sounds really pessimistic, but the optimistic take is over the next five to 10 years, we're going to get burned so bad that it's going to become readily apparent to people that we need to right this ship and do it, you know, do it more safe. Do do it, be more prudent with how we deal with surveillance of our own citizens. Yeah, I wanted to comment. You asked about numbers, and I think I pulled up a study that where this was from two thousand nine, so it's out of date, and I'm sure it's gotten worse, not better, because frankly, more crime is happening, and you know, more digital crime, especially. Um, but in two thousand nine, they were saying that they can only they've only like confiscated 01 percent of you know what they identified as financial criminal activity or even less than that uh meaning like these these are all people went through kyc aml all of the things right and there was three trillion dollars worth of crime they confiscated like three billion or they identified three billion and confiscated less than that so it's a tiny tiny fraction of actual crime that gets stopped um and you know that's that's a major problem because while the three billion dollars they confiscated might sound like a big number it's really nothing it's a drop in the bucket for for the government um, and the burden for the company, see, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't discount that, especially for startups. It's really a big startup uh, killer because if you have to build an entire like BSA compliance department just to make a financial startup, it kills innovation completely. Right. So what that creates is a reliance on other kind of central, more centralized forces of financial, uh, you know, capability, right? Like Swan is built on top of a financial platform that's you know, we, we don't do the, the money laundering stuff, but we have that somebody else doing that for us. Well, th you could say that that's kind of better. You know, we don't have to keep those records. And that's one way that we could say, hey, yeah, Swan is clean. You know, we erase all of the data as soon as we get it. But the reality is we still have to feed it to somebody and they still have to feed it to somebody else. There's still a chain of data that, that gets fed up, right? No matter where, where you are in this ecosystem. So um, in my opinion, we're in a bad place with this. And, and I think the the solution is not like to scrap it all because it's impossible. Consider 
even if all of the Bitcoin companies did super well, had tons of revenue and unlimited resources, then went after lobbying the government. I mean, it's not just a money game, right? There's just also this problem of entrenched systems, entrenched bureaucracies, entrenched systems of government that they're just not going to fire, you know, 40,000 people that work in this in this part of government, or there's probably hundreds of thousands. So uh, to me, the solution is really to build a parallel system. And I think Bitcoin is one of the pieces of that parallel system, because if you think about it today, yes, everybody has to KYC for the most part, and you can mine, you can use a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, but most everyday people aren't going to do that. They're going to probably connect to some regular, uh, peer, uh, regular exchange and buy their Bitcoin KYC. But then what happens to that Bitcoin? It gets spent into the Bitcoin economy. Uh, it's used for goods and services. It's passed down to their children. Um, as long as we're good with using, you know, mixing technologies and lightning network and other things that we haven't even come up with yet that will help us to create an anonymization layer, we start to create this whole parallel economy where the Bitcoin's already been, you know, it's been KYC up front, but we can wash that out. And now it's just circulating in the economy as cash. And in the Bitcoin world, actually, a lot of the concerns that companies have, right? We have anti-fraud concerns, right? We don't care about if you're a terrorist necessarily. Swan doesn't necessarily care. I mean, we care because the government forces us to care. But what we don't want is for somebody to defraud us, right? We don't want somebody to deposit money and then take it back. So we kind of want to know you're not a criminal. But there are ways in the Bitcoin world, the, there's no such thing as chargebacks. There's no reversals, right? That's not an issue. So that goes away. Um, and potentially a lot of other issues too, like identity. We, we don't necessarily need to know your identity. We just need to know your behavior. We need to know that you're, um, you know, that you haven't defrauded anybody else. And that can be done through all kinds of, you know, attestations, zero knowledge proofs. There's ways to explain somebody's behavior without telling you anything about them. Just say, Hey, you know, I, as Swan know this customer has been good for six months. I can tell another company about that without telling them who the customer is or anything, just give them a fingerprint. Um, and I think. If we work towards that system, a parallel system that's a financial system built on Bitcoin with decentralized uh, attestations and things like that, we can actually get to a point where we don't need any of that legacy junk. But I just don't see how we could possibly, it just feels like an impossible fight right now with the resources that we have to, to reverse, to right the ship. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if, if a, a big enough disaster happens, maybe there's something that will be a call to arms for the government to change the regulations, but I'm just not bullish on that at all. Um, I mean, so you made some interesting points there. First of all, uh, it really, the, the burdensome regulation really hurts competition. Like it is absolutely insane to try and launch a regulated startup uh, at this point, a regulated Bitcoin startup. And we saw this firsthand uh, with the bit license in New York, which was even more overbearing than federal regulations. And what happened, right? What happened was you ended up with just a, like you can only have access in New York to like Coinbase and like the, the big dogs. Um, the second thing is, you know, in terms of like actionable steps that I think uh, Bitcoin companies should strive for is, you know, explain the trade-offs to users. Like users, um, it, I think it's always a net benefit that Bitcoiners have more options. But but where the, where the pain happens is when Bitcoiners aren't presented with the actual trade-offs or whatever those options are. Everything has trade-offs. Um, and those trade-offs should be clear earlier rather than later. Um, that's not an indictment against you guys. I think you guys are pretty good about uh, disclosing trade-offs of KYC and privacy issues. Uh, definitely much better than pretty much any other, um, save for maybe bull Bitcoin in, in Canada, than any other you know Bitcoin broker, service, exchange type of situation. Um, the third thing is, it's not just about pushing back on existing regulation. Like I am pretty sure that this trend is going to continue and it's going to get worse. So you were talking about stuff like forward privacy techniques, uh, whether that's using collaborative transactions such as CoinJoin or using Lightning Network, using your own node, holding your own keys, all these different techniques. Um, there's a very real possibility that we end up in a situation where regulators are, you know, basically requiring registration of addresses and almost a, a quasi whitelist system, um, restricting self custody capabilities. Uh, meanwhile, the major lobbying groups uh, in this industry or in the wider crypto industry are way more focused on making sure proof of stake is protected or making sure that tokens aren't 
labeled securities rather than trying to protect self custody, what rather than trying to protect using your own node. Um, fortunately, this year, uh, there's been a couple new organizations that have popped up that are that are Bitcoin specific organizations that are focusing on these issues. Hopefully that will help. Uh, but I, I, I think it's important to realize that this is not static, like it, the, the most likely expectation that everyone should have here is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, agreed. And I, I definitely want to echo your idea about giving people choices and trade-offs and, and the explanations. And, you know, when people email us and they're like, I don't want to give you my ID, we say, okay, well, you can go to a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Here's some other options for you to buy Bitcoin. Um, and there are trade-offs to all those options, right? And I think our job is to fight for the simplest user experience and get as many people onto Bitcoin as possible within this framework, uh, because for us, that's our fastest path to, uh, you know, hyper adoption, hyper Bitcoinization, whatever you want to call it. The more people that have Bitcoin, the more we can actually enact these changes, right? And, and I'm not even talking about changing laws, but also just, you know, like I said, paralyzing a second economy on Bitcoin that doesn't need any of that stuff. And I think... The regulations that you spoke of, they could happen. They could try to do really aggressive stuff like, you know, disclose us all of your addresses on your IRS forms. Um, it's very, very difficult to enforce, right? It's very difficult to enforce. And I think that's the saving grace of Bitcoin is that, uh, you know, I lost my keys in a boating accident, as you all know. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> it's a very, I think, it's I very think <laughs> the danger, the danger of widespread onboarding via KYC is that it becomes much easier to enforce that because they there's there are literally companies that are professional surveillance mercenaries that work with governments and corporations share that data amongst each other to track bitcoin users they have our withdrawal addresses they have our personal identifiable information uh 95 percent 98 percent whatever the number is of people coming into the space are coming in through these regulated broker dealers and they're you know they're they get all they have all this information on them so if you try and claim that you know it's a boating accident i lost my keys and then they start moving like mo like the transactions start moving after that because you obviously didn't lose them um what's going to happen is it's going to be the way I see it is it'll be a situation where you put that regulation in place, whatever that overbearing regulation is, um, you enforce it on a few people and, and you make an example out of them and then the rest will fall in line and comply. And, you know, we just witnessed, um, we just witnessed, you know, 2020 and 2021 where it's, it should be readily obvious to most people that, that give you give people a tiny little bit of fear and most people will roll over and comply. Uh, and the ones that don't, you make examples of. And I just, I don't think, uh, I don't think we can rest on that as an expectation. I think it's going to be, um, and, and, and just because it's not perfectly enforceable, doesn't mean they won't try and doesn't mean it doesn't create a bunch of pain for Bitcoiners and Bitcoiner businesses and the Bitcoin economy right like it you already see people like there's all this argument about like why don't people spend bitcoin and like people are coming up with technical solutions oh we have the lightning network now we have the apps are easier to use like the number one reason that people aren't spending bitcoin and it's not number go up it is it is because it is burdensome as fuck to spend bitcoin and do deal with all the tax regulations yeah. Like that is the number one reason, but nobody talks about it, right? Very few people talk about mm -hmm. it. Agreed. Yeah, no, I think you have, you have some very good points there. I guess the question would be, and I agree with you. I mean, obviously if they make it burdensome enough and make enough examples, I think we saw something similar happen basically in the music world when there was like rampant, you know, music sharing, they, yep. there was the MPAA and they went over, you know, they went after some people from Dallin movies and they put some honey pots out there and people got screwed. And then, Everybody stopped doing it. But really what killed that whole peer-to-peer -peer music thing was the availability of easy to pay for services like iTunes, where people were just willing to pay 99 cents for something that was, you know, that worked and they didn't have to worry about viruses. And I think the danger kind of, as you're pointing out, is that happens in Bitcoin because it is way easier to go to an exchange and give them their, your KYC than it is to necessarily set up your own mining rig or to 
uh, figure out how to use a decentralized exchange and deal with the uncertainty and risks there and, you know, things like that. So people flock to the regulated KYC exchanges because it's just like iTunes. You, you pay and you get a safe experience. Uh, and that does result in this kind of, you know, disclosure of Bitcoin addresses and identities and stuff like that, that the government can go after. Um, I think in America, we have pretty decent property rights, search and seizure stuff that should theoretically protect us. Uh, in practice, obviously, we had things like quarter 6102. Um, I, I, I would like to think that we're past the point where the culture would accept that, but who knows? Um, so what do we do, right? Like, how do we how do we fight against that? And what protections do we have? Is there any hope with things like, uh, you know, coin joins and, and taproot and kind of obscuring um, what we're doing a little bit and moving into other layers and things like that? Or, you know, what do we what do we really do here? Well, I mean, I think from a technical perspective, uh, there should be more focus on building easy to use uh, privacy preserving tools that take into effect, take into account privacy best practices on Bitcoin. That is obviously uh, like major room for improvement there. And like one of the things you see is uh, and I love our open source contributors like Bitcoin, like one of the reasons I have so much conviction in Bitcoin and I dedicate so much of my life to Bitcoin is because we have this blossoming open source community of just contributors around the world that are just working tirelessly for very little pay, if anything at all, um, to build out this, build out this system. Um, but there's a disconnect, right? Because a lot of times, like if you talk to like our real technical geniuses that are working on this stuff, they just ignore the KYC element. They're like, you know, Bitcoin doesn't have KYC at the protocol level. Like, we're not going to pay attention to it, but we can't ignore it anymore. Like 98 percent of people are coming in, disclosing all of their personal information when they come in um, and it's being shared with a bunch of different companies, a bunch of different governments, authoritarians. Like this is also just not an American thing, right? Like people are at risk in in countries where their government is is actively attacking them. Um, and I, I think we need more developer focus, more community focus on building tools that take that into account rather than pretending it's not even an existent problem. So this, uh, this idea of this like parallel sort of financial services system, it's out there, it's floated. And I think a lot of times people think about it as, you know, we're going to recreate like the banking system and the investment class system and commodities and equities and and all kinds of financial instruments and provide, you know, a decentralized layer. That's when someone says like a parallel financial system, that's kind of what they have in mind sometimes. But it was interesting that you come up with like this parallel system for for identity, right? And you, you know, people are talking about digital identity and, and stuff like that, too, like what's being done at Microsoft, uh, for instance, on Bitcoin. Um, this isn't, I mean, Yanni brought it up, like this, this could be something that needs to be, uh, focused on next in the Bitcoin only ecosystem where we are starting to build out these, the on-ramps and these financial services, but maybe some identity verification and some fraud prevention built on top of a Bitcoin or in a decentralized way that's using cryptography. So as not to divulge so much information, right. Uh, might be really interesting. Um, any, Matt, is there anything along the lines, along those lines that I, I'm not aware of or whatever that might be happening. Um, so, I mean, we have CSU Wildcat who's been working on decentralized identity. He was working at it for Microsoft yeah. and now he's at Block, formerly Square. Um, they plan on rolling that into their TV Dex protocol, which is a protocol for uh, P2P transactions, an open protocol that anyone can uh, sync into or work with, uh, including an exchange like Swan Bitcoin. Um, and, but it can also be used for something like, you know, uh, I want to buy a car with Bitcoin, uh, and the individual sellers, the individual transactors there basically decide, uh, what kind of requirements they want. And uh, my basic understanding of the general premise is you basically have, uh, these decentralized ID or distributed ID uh, providers that do different attestations. So they say, uh, you know, Matt lives in this state or, 
you know, Matt has this social media account or Matt has this phone number. And you basically can stack all those attestations on top of this public key, private key pair. Um, and you can have different levels of verification depending on what people want. Mm-hmm. Um, it can also be done in a, in a honeypot minimizing way um, where maybe the provider does an attestation, but uh, they don't actually keep that information or it doesn't say uh, it do- it's not like I'm just uploading my passport to you and scanning my picture or whatever. It's like, we verified this person, but then, you know, the, the seller doesn't actually see that information. They just see that those, those verification checks have been met. Um, so there's something interesting there. Um, it can also go in a complete dystopian way. Uh, so um, I, I think it's important that, that we have we have people like CSU Wildcat that are um, working to try and do it in like a in a in a in a safer, more responsible way. Um, because if we don't, uh, your base there's governments are going to move into the D, the digital ID space. Uh, so if we don't have uh, you know a distributed open protocol, uh, we are going to get a very very dystopian alternative. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's possible that we get like, a, I think you're referring to something like the Chinese social credit system yeah. based on this idea. And that could happen even regardless of whether governments move into it or not, because I think at the end of the day, it's like, what we're, what we're, what the system is designed for is the idea of attesting to some fact without necessarily knowing the person, like knowing the identity tied to it. So I can bring my own bundle of attestations and say like, hey, this thing says I'm over 18. This thing says... I haven't done any crime in the last year. You know, this thing says whatever. And I can give that to a service and they can see that I check all those boxes without knowing anything about me. They don't know who I am or anything like that. They just know that these attestations have been provided by some authorities that they trust, which is a cool idea. It's definitely better than me uploading my ID and then them having that ID and then them still running the same background checks and finding out all the same information about me. But now they've got it all. Um, so the kind of decentralized or at least encrypted at the stations actually it has nothing to do with decentralization. It's literally right. hash some things and, and you're done. Right. Um, yeah. that concept is, is not new, but storing it on Bitcoin or, or something like that is kind of cool. Um, but nonetheless, it's like that, that system to me is way better, but it could be abused. Right. And people, you could end up with even, uh, governments or even companies that say, okay, in order to use our service, I need these 10 at the stations, including like. I need to know that you know you're healthy in these particular ways, or you've been vaccinated, or you don't smoke, or whatever, right? So it could create the same exact type of system. Um, but to be clear, there's nothing stopping that system today. I think it's just this is a better way of doing it without revealing private information. So, you know, I'm, I'm still bullish on that kind of idea in general. Yeah, I mean, the cool part is that it's well, at least as I understand it, the idea is an open protocol, right? So it's not. I wouldn't call it decentralized. I agree with you on that. Um, but it, the fact that it's open means that like I could run a, like a did service. Uh, I might, you might not even know who I am, right? Like I just run it through tour. I'm just a NIM that has like a good reputation and I run my own did service. Now, will we, will we actually see that in practice? It's yet to be seen, but the fact that it would be an open protocol rather than a closed system, um, is a is a massive net benefit in terms of competition and innovation and whatnot in that regard the other thing is um one of the issues we see and i talked about this when last time i was on with you guys talking about the dangers of kyc aml is you can reduce the threat if you choose one trusted service but what we see nowadays is like a newcomer comes in they sign up to like eight different regulated services they send their information to like a million different places um, if we had a open protocol for distributed identity, you just send it to one and then it's interchangeable with the others. So you're not, you're not providing it into seven honeypots. You're providing it into one honeypot, which reduces that risk. And then the third thing is, um, eventually most people won't buy Bitcoin and most people won't sell Bitcoin. They will earn Bitcoin and they will spend Bitcoin and there will be a proper circular economy. Um, so most of the things we're discussing here are things that we're talking about in that adoption phase. Now, and the question is, how long is that adoption phase going to be? You know, some people think it could be as little as five years or 10 years. Other people think it might be 40 or 50. I'm not going to make a guess on that. We should just assume the adoption phase is going to be longer rather than shorter. 
Um, but the point remains that when we are operating on a proper Bitcoin standard, that whole connection to the fiat banking legacy system, which is the whole that that's that's the central point of failure that that is causing all this pain mm -hmm. um, gets removed. Yeah, well, there's I think there's two things causing the pain. One is like pull payments because they're reversible. So anytime you pull from anybody's bank, you have a vector for fraud. So that goes away on Bitcoin, as we said. So that eliminates the need for companies to collect KYC for that reason, just to know that person is like legitimate because why should they care? But the government would still say, oh, but there are terrorists and we don't want terrorists, you know, using your whatever. Let's say you have a, a lending platform that uses Bitcoin back loans or something. We don't want them on your on your platform. Uh, and you're still like required to do something to verify they're not a terrorist. So, you know, to some degree that doesn't go away uh, unless you want to look at the really deep root cause of like why terrorism is a thing and say that maybe Bitcoin fixes that which I, I actually would say that, but that's a much, much longer. That's a multi-century play, <laughs> not a multi-decade play. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do think there's there's a certain um, aspect to just pretty much Big Brother will always require this because terrorism will always be a thing, or at least it will always be purported to be a thing and it will be maintained as a, a system of power. Um, and, it, you know, it will force companies into doing that. De decentralized or not, you're going to have this problem. So that that worries me a bit, and I'm not sure how to fight back against it at all. There is something interesting about <clears throat> Bitcoin providing states, like sovereign states, to uh, with resources or at least the ability to sort of snub these international bodies, regulatory bodies that are mostly run by the United States and the G7, including like El Salvador, of course, and the and the IMF, and creating this new bond structure and allowing them to raise money in the sovereign bond market, but also. Um, the FATF, which is the you know international kind of arm of of internet of uh, AML KYC law, and they use all kinds of coercive you know means to you know strong arm smaller countries into being a, a part of their regulatory regime. Um, if you have you know the game theory could say if you have like a, a Bitcoin based economy that's um, you could you know you could say like look we're not going to abide by FATF rules here right like. It's a, it's a going to be actually an open Bitcoin economy. We're not going to mess with you know any of these regulations. KYC, AML, VATF doesn't do not apply. We'll, we'll exit your inter, you know international fiat economy and we'll enter into this like global uh, Bitcoin economy and separate completely from that fiat system. You could I could see something like that happening and just you know a country just declaring like look we're we're off the grid like you know and we don't care uh, about all the consequences. Your coercion doesn't work anymore because we have this global monetary system we can tap into. I mean, you I don't even have to imagine it, right? Because yeah. like El Salvador has its own pains in terms of the Chiva wallet. And I've been very outspoken that the government run Chiva wallet uh, has a lot of privacy concerns and is, you know, very much seems like a surveillance tool to me. Um, but besides that, right, they all they did was take away that simple burden, right, which was that every time you make a Bitcoin transaction, uh, that's a taxable event. And they removed that by calling it legal tender and declaring it legal tender. And now you actually have a circular economy that is blossoming in El Salvador, where once again, where people can, rather than buy Bitcoin, they can earn it. And rather than sell Bitcoin, they can spend it in a relatively frictionless way. And, and that, that, like, that tiny little, I mean, I say tiny, but it's a massive change. That massive, that massive structural change government-wise um, is all all it really takes to significantly improve our situation in terms of this yeah i i agree and i think the other interesting thing there is like you know the imf was holding this loan over their head and being like hey if you guys want like a billion dollar loan you know uh don't do bitcoin and they're like uh <laughs> nah we're good I mean, bitcoin's better <laughs> so like i think that actually if you dig deeper into that and again I'm not being a bukele fanboy or anything like that and not knowing the situation on the ground i'm not going to comment on what's actually happening but from a game theoretical standpoint of when a country basically says we're not going to participate in this system which you could argue is just designed to oppress these poorer countries and extract value out of them uh for the benefit of like you know the g7 if you say okay i'm not playing your game anymore we've got bitcoin we're self-sovereign that creates a stronger economy in the country that creates prosperity for the people the people become wealthier they're no longer beholden to this like debt cycle and what does that do over time? I mean, if you think about like where terrorism comes from, it doesn't come from 
wealthy countries that every, where everything's fine. Like it comes from from poverty and it comes from people being frustrated uh, from from having to live by somebody else's rule. Right. So when you give countries the option of self-sovereignty through Bitcoin, I think like the optimism and me the optimist in me is like this actually fixes terrorism. Right. If people can be prosperous, they can build businesses, they can build up their local economy like we're seeing in El Salvador. That's going to squash out the need for crime because crime comes from poverty. Like you don't, you know, I mean, there's going to be bad people always, but fundamentally that's a big part of it. So once you squash the poverty aspect and you fix people's ability to earn money and keep money and actually have that wealth, they can pass it on to their children and grow it. Um, that's a huge vector of why this whole problem even exists. And so now you're in a parallel economy, you're using Bitcoin. There's no need for KYC for fraud reasons. And now there's no need for KYC for terrorism reasons either, because you know, you fix the problem. So, uh, can we see some more nation states adopting Bitcoin ASAP, please? <laughs> I, I mean, those are really good points. I mean, I would also just add, like, you know, until, you know, maybe the 80s, like we like we lived on a pretty much dominant cash based society. Uh, you know, authorities weren't easily able to track our location in real time. They weren't able to do facial recognition. They weren't able to do all these different surveillance tactics that are become standard today. And they still caught criminals like they caught criminals. They did good old fashioned police work like there's there's these aren't necessary tools in terms of actually fighting criminals. Um, it, like I just I, it's crazy to me that pe there's there's a constant feeling that I get from people that it's, it's always been this way and it hasn't always been this way. And it was fine before it was this way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, catching criminals for doing crime rather than uh, the financial aspect. I mean, yes, that's the way. I think I think the counter argument to that is what people would say is that just so much activity has moved online, right? So like the crime now is basically like financing terrorists. That is the crime because all it is is like people are just sending money. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the you know, authorities at this point because like I, you know, like I again, I, I would rather not have to deal with that. But, you know, that's what the government thinks, right? They think that they're, they're trying to do something good um, and protect people if you if you kind of believe uh, believe it on face value. So that is an issue, right? Because like I definitely yes, agree with you. That they should catch the terrorists the doing the terrorism, but really the way they do it is they look at the, how the funds are flowing. So that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree that, that there are certainly some people in the government who think that this is an important way and and justified, morally justified way to to fight terrorism. But there, I would venture to guess. A lot more who see it for the power that it really holds, and yeah. that's why they value it. Um, yeah. You know, As but free you, surveillance. I mean, it's just like you can't you can't beat <laughs> having like every bank in the world being like a free policeman for you. It's just amazing for the government, right? Like, but like, what was that situation like when we left Afghanistan last year? Like, we just left like pallets of hundred dollar bills. Like they just like the Taliban just came in and just took pallets of hundred dollar bills, right? And there's. <laughs> KYC AML doesn't stop that. It's cash, you know, but meanwhile, they're surveilling all of us right. and they just handed the Taliban however much money in cash. <laughs> like it just logically just all bullshit. Like it's just it so much of it work. is bullshit. There's a minuscule little bit of logic there. And then just the rest of it is just bullshit. Built yeah. On I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Like any of the stats tell you they're not catching shit with this. And that's, that's the reality. Right. And so if anybody is actually faced with that data, you know, but that's not how, how governments operate. It's like, oh, no. well, we caught $3 billion worth of, of crime. So therefore, give us, you know, the 50% more budget for next year so we can catch $4 billion worth of crime. So like, that's how they think, right? They're like, they just think, how do I grow my department? And that's going to happen regardless of how effective it is. Yeah. And there's, so the FATF has like these measurements, you know, th these effectiveness evaluations. And just like the... Um, the CPI, they adjust them, they move the goalposts year after year. And it's hard to come by analysis that, that tries to, um, you know, hold the FATF to account without, you know, beyond, without moving their goalposts. So like, let's adjust for like the original goalposts. Um, so current anti-money laundering uh, policy prescription helps authorities intercept about $3 billion of an estimated $3 trillion in criminal funds generated annually, a 0.1% success rate, and costs banks and other businesses more than $300 billion in compliance costs, more than a hundred times the amounts recovered from criminals. That is the inefficiency that is created yeah, by this that's system. Insane. 
And then let's add on top of the, the you know, massive like global invasion of privacy. So they took $300 billion <laughs> worth of private industry money and turned it into $3 billion of government money. So it's yes. like, <laughs> what? I'll, I'll, link to this. Like I'll link to this in the show yeah. notes. And when we get over to spaces, I'll put it in the nest. But, and by the way, anybody listening on spaces will be over there here in a few minutes. Um, so get your questions ready. Um, yeah, actually, that's probably a good spot for us to pause uh, this portion of the show, unless anybody's got something to wrap up with here and then we'll move over to spaces for a q a i'm just gonna put this out there for anybody who is working on stuff like uh like the csu wildcat like daniel's doing um i mean that stuff is really really interesting i would love to hear about projects in the decentralized at the station space uh that will move us forward to a better way of doing these things but even more so i'm just really excited to get the hell off of the legacy financial system so we don't have to think about this stuff anymore Cheers to that. I just wanted to thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to the Q&A on Twitter Spaces. And just usually when we talk about privacy, when we talk about sovereignty, like people get really overwhelmed very easily. Um, this is not about being like ninja level private. It's not about being, you know, uh, the most ultimate secure situation or whatever. Every little improvement you make in your daily lives, whether that's Bitcoin or whether that's general digital privacy, does make a difference. Uh, at scale, when many people do it, it helps us all. So just take the little steps. Don't go. Don't get overwhelmed, and just constantly consider. You know, just consider all the data you're sharing on a daily basis. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, gents. I'll give you a moment to move over to Twitter Spaces, and I will come join you there as well as soon as we sign off. All right. Thanks so much for joining us here on YouTube. Uh, please do head over to Twitter Spaces at Swan Bitcoin, at Swan Bitcoin. You'll find the space there. Or if you're already following Swan, it should be up at the top of your Twitter app on your device. Uh, head over to swanbitcoin.com and uh, set up an account today. Again, it just takes a few minutes to get set up. Um, we provide uh, education about what's going on here. Uh, we all are long-term concern here for the business and our uh, our bet is that if we help people understand this uh, revolution that is happening around us, uh, that they will be uh, become customers of Swan and join us for the journey. And we hope to be there alongside you uh, on that journey. Um, we aim to be a safe space uh, to send your friends and family uh, when they're getting into this uh, brave new world of Bitcoin. And uh, we will do our best to take care of them and to usher them along that path, that Bitcoin journey um, that you have been on and uh, help you uh, usher them along on that path and maybe ease up your, uh, you know, the Bitcoin guy burden uh, that you have a little bit. We also have the fastest onboarding for entities uh, in the United States. We can get entities onboarded, meaning companies or trusts or uh, nonprofits, et cetera, uh, legal entities onboarded in as little as a day uh, in some cases, in a few days, uh, typically two, two days, I think is, around, is our average. And that is uh, far better than the many weeks and sometimes months it takes at some of our larger competitors. So if you have a business and you're looking to stack Bitcoin for your business, Swan is by far the best way to go. You'll get connected with a team um, that actually will listen to you, take your calls, uh, answer your emails, uh, hit you up and um, answer your chats uh, on the website, et cetera. So we have a team that is there to listen and take care of you and, and help you understand what's going on and make the best choices for you, for your family, and for your business. So you can go to swanbitcoin.com slash private to check that out. High net worth individuals, corporations, and other entities. Uh, and you'll be connected with uh, one of the best and brightest in Bitcoin to help you on your journey and make great decisions uh, about your uh, Bitcoin investments and uh, movement into well, a Bitcoin world. We're going there. We're heading there. So we're excited to be along in the journey with everybody on that front. Now we're going to continue the journey of this little show over on Twitter spaces right now. So we'll see you over there. Thanks.